uh, do make an effort to see this. Um, this is um, just a brief couple of comments about paragraph 175 that I want to say just to introduce the film since uh, you'll see it before my lecture on Tuesday. Um, paragraph 175 refers to a law. Uh, that's what it's about. Uh, it's a particular law that was in place in Germany uh, beginning in 1871, which uh, outlawed uh, homosexuality. Uh, the law was put in place uh, following the unification of Germany in 1871 under Bismarck, and uh, the Nazis kept this law in place and they actually strengthened it. That is to say, um, they made it stronger and they enacted more and more uh, punishments uh, for what they considered to be the crime of homosexuality. Um, Hitler considered homosexuality uh, by the 1940s to be a crime against the German nation and it was punishable uh, by imprisonment uh, or death. Um, I also mentioned that homosexuals, uh, particularly male homosexuals, uh, men, gay men, were uh, tracked uh, by the Nazi state. Uh, tallies were drawn up. Um, bars and clubs and other things were closed down and uh, suspected homosexuals were arrested, put, brought to detention camps and eventually brought to concentration camps specifically ones within Germany. Um, homosexuality was not something that the Nazis combated uh, in all the lands that they conquered. It was something specific that they were concerned about in the, so to speak, the homeland. So it was combated within Germany and Austria, and Austria, as you know, was considered kind of a greater Germany uh, when it was annexed uh, by Germany. So uh, paragraph 175 is the law. The movie is uh, a documentary about um, the history, I guess very quickly, the history of homosexuality in early 20th century Germany. And it has a number of interviews uh, with survivors who spent time in various concentration camps uh, for their so-called crime. Um, that's, uh, yeah, that's what the film is about. So I'll talk next time about uh, two victim groups that we haven't talked uh, really at all about, uh, one being uh, homosexuals and second being gypsies. Um, and in order for us to have a sort of a broader panorama of other groups that were targeted by the Nazis um, uh, yeah, in the 19, uh, 1930s and 40s. Okay, so try to make the film screening again Monday, 7 o'clock here. Um, today we're going to, we're taking, a, we're going to look at two uh, texts uh, today. One, uh, a portion of a memoir uh, by Ruth Kluger, um, which I excerpted in the course reader for us, and then uh, Art Spiegelman's Mouse. And um, the thing I want to start, start with today is uh, a question that we've been examining um, in many different formats in this class. This is a class, uh, as you know from the very beginning, which is not strictly a history of the Holocaust, but it's a history of the representation of the Holocaust. And that's a different thing. Um, the history of the Holocaust um, maybe refers to um, the events themselves, the dates, the actions, what we know of what happened. The representations are the ways in which th that knowledge, those historical events, are conveyed through various media. And those media can be uh, works of literature, like Bernard Schlink's The Novel. They can be, no they can be memoirs, uh, such as the ones that we've read by Elie Wiesel, Ruth Kluger, Primo Levi. They can be first-hand knowledge, uh, as uh, conveyed by survivors like Dana Schwartz when she came to class. Uh, so her personal testimony. Um, they can be graphic novels, uh, uh, as in the case of Mouse, or works of graphic nonfiction, in fact, is what Spiegelman calls it. He doesn't consider his work a novel. Um, and so we also want to begin to understand the genres or different genres that exist for thinking about the Holocaust. We've obviously looked at film. We've also looked at photographs. Um, all of these are genres. Genres aren't limited just to textual material. Um, although certainly texts have many different genres, like novels, memoirs, works of history, nonfiction, um, even completely invented fabrications uh, are, are there are certain generic conventions that go with these. Um, but genre could also mean non-textual. Uh, so film, uh, visual illustrations, uh, photographs, and even digital media. Uh, all of these things are ways in which the Holocaust is represented and also the way in which uh, we uh, 
we come to terms with it, the way in which we receive it, right? So much of the knowledge that we receive, I mean, you could almost say that a film like Schindler's List is a, because of the massive penetration of this film uh, in popular culture, the fact that it's almost something that everyone has seen, um, that this is the way in which uh, our understanding of the historical event of the Holocaust is very much mediated uh, through the genre of film. Um, now, obviously, in a class like this, we've looked at a multiplicity of genres. And there's a number of uh, distinctions that have to be made even within the genre of the memoir. Um, Elie Wiesel and Primo Levi, I think, are narrating their life stories in a different way and also at a different time than Ruth Kluger. And this already provides a different kind of perspective uh, on the events that they're talking about. Um, Elie Wiesel and Primo Levi both wrote uh, their memoirs relatively close to after the liber after liberation. Um, true enough, I think, as I mentioned with Elie Wiesel, it wasn't immediately published. Uh, in fact, the initial uh, publishers of his memoir, um, when it was written in Yiddish and later in French, uh, rejected it. Uh, they didn't think people wanted to hear about it, that it would never be a bestseller. Um, maybe it didn't even have the ambitions of being a bestseller. It had the ambitions, though, of conveying the story to a broader public. Uh, so in that regard, at least it had an idea. I think Wiesel had the idea that the story would have some resonance beyond himself. Uh, and certainly Primo Levi, and I think I had spoken about the dream that he had while in the concentration camps about telling his story, or the dream of no one caring about his story, is actually a structuring element of the memoir itself, right? So they wrote these memoirs relatively soon after the liberation, um, not with, I, I don't think, not with the perspective of many decades that ensued, but really, I think, to encapsulate uh, the history on both a very personal level, that is to say, a kind of singular story of a particular survivor, and then embedded within a much broader story of stories that either couldn't be told because they weren't known. Uh, in the case of Primo Levi, there's these gaps that he is very conscious of, the drowned, right? The people who don't get to write memoirs or tell their stories. And in the case of Elie Wiesel, I think a similar uh, acknowledgement or understanding, but also the fact that his story is embedded within a whole network of other stories that begin to you know, paint the panorama of the complexity of the Holocaust. Um, that's important because the genre here is of a memoir is not just the subjective story of a particular survivor, but the way in which they embed that story in a network of other stories and a kind of consciousness of I think very fundamental absences in that narrative, right? Again, the stories of the people who don't get to write memoirs. And I had said that this uh, genre of the memoir, I think early on when we talked about Wiesel and Levy, but now we could add Kluger, this genre of a memoir is an anomaly. Um, the reason I had said it's an anomaly is because we can't just take um, this memoir or Primo Levi or Elie Wiesel and say, aha, this is what happened to everybody. Um, there are certain things that certainly did happen to lots of people, and there are certain things that can be extrapolated and generalized, but there's something important about the fact that they survived, right, that's both enabling their testimony, but also, in some ways, limiting their testimony. Um, the stories of the people who didn't survive, those stories won't be told. Uh, it's the kind of what Levy calls very profoundly, it's testimony made on behalf of third parties. Uh, it's testimony of the survivors that could stand for something else, uh, that could stand for the experiences of others, but for the most part, most of the people, six million or so people uh, with regard to Jews, don't have stories that were told. Um, this doesn't in any way negate these memoirs. It's just a consciousness that we have to have, a, almost like a, an important, very fundamental grain of salt that we have to take them with which is the fact that they also, as much as they're telling a story, there are all these non-stories behind them. Okay? So that's all, that's the only point I want to make. It's not in any way to negate or question the validity of the memoirs. It's not about that. It's simply to say that as much as we want to read these memoirs and take them seriously and understand what they have to say, just remember all those millions of voices behind them that don't have stories. And so in that regard, they're an anomaly. All right, 
Um, so, to talk about Ruth Kluger, um, the name of her memoir, um, which is, uh, this is the book uh, that I excerpted from, um, it's, it's relatively long. Um, it was written first in German. In German it was called Weiter Leben, which means uh, living on or continuing to live. Uh, it came out a number of years before the English uh, version, which she also wrote. Um, it wasn't really a translation of the German version because she wanted to pen uh, she really wanted to pen her memoir for two different audiences. She wanted to pen it first for a German audience, and she wanted to pen it second for an American or English-speaking audience. Um, so many of the things are the same in the two memoirs, uh, but there are a number of references, cultural references, and I think, um, yeah, certain pr primarily cultural references that are different in the English and the German version. Um, this came out in 2001, and uh, the work has been was hailed as uh, a classic uh, on the lines or of the same depth and quality and profundity of works by uh, people like Wiesel and Levy. Um, but it's a very different um, memoir in some ways. And it largely has to do, I think, with the perspective, what I call here the perspective on the Holocaust, which is a perspective that she has that's um, grounded in basically 50 years later, like looking back and remembering these from the perspective of actually having lived her life uh, and lived a significant part of her life. Uh, she's still alive, uh, so that's another thing to emphasize. She was born in 1931. Um, she had come to, uh, early on when I started teaching the Holocaust class, um, she had made the trek up from Irvine to UCLA and would speak to our classes, um, and she did that for a couple of years. Um, she's... Uh, you know, as someone who was born in 1931, has various health uh, issues, it became a little bit harder um, each year for her to come. But she's still very active on the speaking circuit, just very recently in Germany, talking about her work. And uh, it's won numerous awards, mainly because I think that she's, um, she's approaching the Holocaust and the memory of the Holocaust from a perspective that I think is, um, is in some ways gritty, in some ways somewhat ironic, but also a kind of almost truth-telling that, uh, that I think we maybe, uh, which maybe distinguishes what she's saying um, in some ways from certainly the novels like Schlink that we've read, uh, but in some ways I think adds another layer of complexity. Um, she's not painting an idealized picture of herself or of her mother. Um, she's not painting a kind of, uh, there's certainly no real happy ending in the story, and to say there's no real happy ending in any memoir, to be sure. Um, but I think that uh, there's a certain kind of candidness about her writing style, and I think a certain kind of uh, critical perspective that uh, the last 50 or so years have provided. And I think that critical perspective largely has to do with the way in which the Holocaust been, has been received. Uh, the way in which we've learned about it, uh, the way it's been represented in films, the way in which Germany has come to terms with the Holocaust, the way the U.S. has come to terms with the Holocaust, the way Israel has come to terms with the Holocaust, the way uh, various people have encountered it and begun to understand it. Um, and so that time has also allowed her to write in a way that um, she's writing from the perspective of the present, right, and she's remembering things that happened in the past, and the memory that we have of the past is not always you know, a one-to-one -one relationship, but it's often mediated in different ways by our understanding in the present, right? So, I mean, often the way we think about things in the past changes depending on our perspective. Uh, the older we get, sometimes our understanding of events will change. And that's something that Kluger is very conscious of. And I think that's something that's very important in her memoir. Um, yeah, so let me talk a little bit more about uh, who she is. Um, so like I said, she was born in 1931. She was um, raised in Vienna. Um, in, the, in this period, uh, towards the first half of the 20th century, I mean, Vienna was still considered a very significant uh, cultural capital of Europe, uh, perhaps uh, on par uh, basically with the other cultural capital of Western Europe being Paris, um, a place, uh, as you probably know, um, birthplace of Freud, of psychoanalysis, a great intellectual and literary tradition that was associated with it, as well as, of course, a great artistic tradition, um, most notably uh, the turn of the century Art Nouveau movement, which was so central for Vienna. Um, she grew up in a place uh, that was, um, it, Vienna was a, certainly considered a Jewish city, 
Um, but uh, like many of the major cities that we've looked at, like Paris or Berlin, uh, was not predominantly Jewish. Um, so the numbers we're talking about here, around 10%. Um, she was in a secular family, um, and she in fact even declares at one point, and at the very start of the part that I gave you, that she was never even particularly proud of being a Jew. Uh, that is to say, she said as, as much, um, she says, I must confess that my Jewishness is really nothing to be proud of. I mean, it's a kind of a funny way to begin uh, your memoir when, of course, you're persecuted on behalf of uh, an identity that's been certainly ascribed to you and essentialized, right? So this identity is like, now you're no longer human, you're Jew. And uh, you will wear this badge, uh, this, identifica this identification star, right? You'll be reduced in some sense to your Jewishness. And yet, from her perspective, her Jewishness was really just almost a, a random part of her identity. As much as she was from Vienna, as much as she was born in this, at this particular time, space, juncture in, in history. Um, the other thing that she says, and I think this is important too, is that she also, as much as she is a Holocaust survivor, she doesn't consider herself um, from Auschwitz. Um, and of course, no one would probably consider some, themselves from Auschwitz. But that part of her identity, she doesn't want to essentialize either. So as much as she doesn't want to essentialize her Jewishness, which for the Nazis was the essential thing that they cared about, she doesn't want to essentialize from the post-war perspective the fact that she was a survivor of Auschwitz. Um, she spent time there. She was deported uh, with her mother, as you know from the memoir, first to Theresienstadt, later to Auschwitz, and then finally uh, to a work camp associated with Auschwitz. And then she escaped on a death march, um, similar to the way Elie Wiesel escaped. Uh, but in the case of uh, Kluger and her mom, she actually escaped in a southern German town and she eventually got new identity papers. She got uh, new identification, new name, and was basically considered or took up at the end of the war a Christian identity in a small Bavarian town in the south of Germany. Um, this is very similar to the story that Dana Schwartz tells about her and her mom. Again, getting a new papers, a new identity, essentially passing as Christian German, uh, in this case of Kluger and her mom, in order to live uh, the last months of the war. Um, significantly, and this is, this is the case in most of these memoirs, they happened late in the war. Uh, almost all took place between 44 and 45 uh, during those later years. Had she been uh, deported earlier, uh, it's very unlikely she would have survived. Same thing with Primo Levi and Ali Wiesel. They uh, were deported at a relatively late point in the war, and uh, the very fact that the, that the Russian front had advanced to such an extent that the camps in, by January of 1945 were being liberated, uh, particularly uh, camps that were in Poland, or other camps in Poland had already been shut down. Um, this is uh, one of the things that was you know, a historical factual event that allowed, um, that allowed her to survive. So she says on 112 with regard to her being from Auschwitz, and I think it's worth reading because it's, a, it's an interesting thing. As much as she says, you know, I'm from Vienna, I don't essentialize my Jewishness, she doesn't essentialize the fact that she's a Holocaust survivor either. So she says, I don't hail from Auschwitz, I come from Vienna. Vienna is a part of me, that's where I acquired consciousness and acquired language. But Auschwitz was, a fo was as foreign to me as the moon. Vienna is part of my mindset while Auschwitz was a lunatic terra incognita, the memory of which is like a bullet lodged in the soul where no surgery can reach it. Auschwitz was merely a gruesome accident. So what does this mean? I mean, Auschwitz, a lunatic terra incognita, lunatic, crazy, terra incognita, a place of the unknown. Um, but then it's like a bullet, a bullet lodged in the soul where no surgery can reach it. What do you take that to mean? I mean, a bullet lodged in the soul where no surgery can reach it. How would you translate that? I mean, what does that mean? I mean, it's an extraordinary, like, deep metaphor, right, to talk about uh, what Auschwitz means for, for a survivor. I mean, when we, like, talk to Holocaust survivors, I mean, for us, we sometimes maybe inadvertently um, essentialize that their experience of the Holocaust is the central thing that makes them who they are, right? And maybe that's unfair. And in fact, uh, for Kluger, she's like, yes, I, I went through the, I survived the Holocaust. I was in Auschwitz. 
uh, but it's an accident. Uh, that is to say, it's an accident that she ended up there, and it's also an accident that she survived. Um, and so to call it like a bullet lodged in her soul that no surgery can reach, what would you say? I mean, that's interesting. I mean, you're right. I mean, last time we talked about, yeah, with regard to, yeah, the, the reparations, right? We talked about um, the idea that a survivor could be paid a certain amount of money by, say, in this case, a perpetrator, but even by the German state. And they say, aha, this is to, you know, make good on your, you know, the bad experiences that you had. Um, but here, there's like an experience that she has that, that I don't think it has any, it doesn't have any monetary value. It doesn't have any, you know, eventually you can't, uh, you can't explain it ultimately, um, and yet it's a fundamental part of uh, you know her her identity. I mean, a bullet. I mean, you know, you had been. I mean, just take it literally. You been shot. I mean, and there's a bullet lodged in you, and it's lodged in your soul, right? I mean, it's not lodged in your physical body. It's somehow in your soul. I mean, that's a pretty powerful image. Um, you can never remove it, so it's it's fundamentally there. It's part of who she is. She didn't choose it. You know, no one chose to go to Auschwitz. Uh, so it's not a voluntary part of her identity. I mean, we like to think that, you know, we form ourselves, you know, our identities, you know, self-determination, our own destinies, you know, we get to do things. This is something that was done to her, right? And then became a very fundamental thing. It's in her soul, you know, at the deepest recesses of who she is. It's fundamentally there. She can't get rid of it. No one can. And yet, you know, you, you continue to live, you know, you're still alive, you're living on. This is the life that you live for the next how many decades, you know, of your life. So, it's a, it's a very powerful uh, image, yeah. So I know we have protests going on today, um, you know, I think that uh, if you decide you want to join a protest, you know, you should uh, feel free to do so. I take it by the fact that you're here, that you would want to hear the lecture, um, and so I invite you certainly to hear the lecture. But if you decide that you're moved, that you want to protest, um, I will, you know, support you. So, <laughs> um, however, I appreciate to be able to give the lecture, though, for those who want to stay. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, what distinguishes her memoir from Elie Wiesel or Primo Levi. I mean, if we had to, I mean, just even the most basic level, I mean, how is it similar? How is it different? Um, what would you say? I mean, if you just had to say, like, oh, it's like this or it's not like that, it reminds me of anything that uh, comes to mind and as you read it, I mean, any differences or similarities between other Holocaust memoirs that we've read for class, or even from Dana Schwartz, you know, who we heard, you know, her testimony firsthand. Thoughts? Hmm? Hmm. She does, yeah. Do you remember where or what? what? Um, right. And I think that's an important part of the, the genre of the memoir, right? As much as it's, again, the subjective story of a particular person's experiences, and subjective here doesn't mean fictional. Subjective means personal and of an individual uh, subject. Uh, and this can be entirely factual, and often, I mean, they, they largely are entirely factual. So you can be entirely subjective and factual at the same time, uh, and that's important. Um, but you're right, she embeds the story in a network of other stories, right? That is to say, her story is also in a context, uh, both historical, cultural, um, but also a context that extends beyond the period of 1933 to 1945. It's a context which is also the post-war period and everything that she's gone through and remembers um, after the war. So it's, uh, it's also written from the perspective of someone who's aged. I mean, I think that's, that's important. Um, it's written from the perspective of someone who has lived a significant part of her life and is looking back and trying to understand the meaning of the events that uh, uprooted her from her childhood um, city, uh, destroyed her family, uh, her culture, and resulted in her, you know, her move, eventually survival, and then moved to the United States, and, uh, and continued in some ways interesting 
um, study of, ger of German, of German literature and German history. She ended up becoming a professor. Um, she was the first female chair of the German department in Princeton and then later at the University of California, Irvine, uh, where she's a professor emerita now. Um, and so studied German uh, in, a some, in a similar way to like the way that Ceylon wrote in German because it was a language of culture. Uh, Kluger studied German. Uh, she studied the great German literature, philosophical, uh, artistic, cultural traditions that made up the canon of German thought. Um, and there's a sort of, uh, I think, a very deep connection between the, the barbarism and violence of the Holocaust and this other tradition which uh, was in some ways negated uh, in some very fundamental ways uh, by the violence of the Holocaust. Say again, I couldn't barely hear you. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. How she perceives it, exactly. I mean, th exactly. The German language. It's always. We had seen this with uh, Arendt, with Ceylon, with Nelly Sachs, with other people who, you know, the decision to write in German, to think about Germany, even, I mean, you could even go so far as, I mean, people, you know, survivors and uh, children of survivors sometimes say, you know, could you ever go back to Germany? Could you go live in Germany? Could you listen to the German language? Could you talk to Germans? Um, I mean, there's a sense that uh, the, the, the roots uh, of the Holocaust not only stretch back before 33, but they also continue after 45. Uh, and, uh, and certainly the impact, uh, the memory, the consequences, all of this coming to terms with the past, all is something that's happened in decades upon decades after. Um, weren't it interesting, just as, this is not really a footnote, but it's uh, an interesting transitional moment that um, we'll probably live through very soon, which is the passing of the eyewitnesses, where there won't be any more survivors alive and there won't be any more perpetrators. And so our relationship to the historical event is going to change. I mean, it would be something like, you know, like the French Revolution. No one, there's no one who was there who saw it. There's no one who can raise their hands and say, no, no, it was actually like this. Um, you know, there may be new historical documents which may surface, uh, new archives, things like that. Um, but for the most part, uh, there won't be any eyewitnesses in maybe 10 or 15 uh, years from now. And so our relationship to the event is also going to change because it's only going to be about mediation meaning it's only going to be about the ways in which it's represented in books and films and history books and classes and things like that. So that's the only way we're going to have access to it, um, which is why this class is all about representations. Uh, we had an opportunity to talk to a survivor, and those of you in the honors class talked to more than one survivor, and you, know, you would find, I think, a different level of complexity uh, when you talk to eyewitnesses who were there, a different texture of events. You know, things that get left out, the, the sounds, the smells, the personal feelings, the emotions, those, those things that are very difficult to articulate uh, are, of course, part of our personal experiences, the memories that compose who we are. Um, these things, uh, needless to say, are going, are going to fade in some very fundamental way in the next probably decade or two. All right. A um, couple other things I want to say about Kluger before um, moving on. I want to say just two experiences that I think are, are just really worthy of talking about. One is the selection experience that happens in Auschwitz on the train tracks uh, where uh, women have already been separated from men and they're choosing um, people who can work. Uh, so this happens on 107, uh, 108. And it's a similar experience as what uh, Elie, uh, Elie Wiesel talks about where he's too young. He's not 15. Um, he's young and he's told to lie about his age so, so that he doesn't uh, get selected for the gas chambers. Uh, Kluger um, is 13 and so she thinks, uh, um, or sorry, sorry, she's 12 and she's going to say that she's 13, maybe 14, but she can't possibly imagine saying that she's 15. She's too small, she's young, she's three years uh, out and she's ready, basically, she is told that she should lie uh, tell them that you're 15, and this is uh, apparently being confronted with Joseph Mengele on the, I mean, a really extraordinarily, you know, almost incomprehensible moment of being, of that moment of being selected for life or death. I mean, a very 
dramatic and you know almost uh, yeah playing God in a way, which is what uh, the perspective of I think Mingala is here, and uh, she says that um, she survives because of the in- the intervention in fact, of a woman who was working with Mengele. That is to say, someone who was possibly a prisoner herself, who says, um, in fact, intervenes to save her life. And I'll, I'll read the part at the bottom here. It's, it's really, I think, quite fascinating. Um, she says, um, so there's a, this is at the selection, and uh, the woman comes up to her, and it's a clerk, someone working with Joseph Mengele on the, on the selection, she said, um, when she saw me, she left her post, meaning this woman, uh, who was possibly a Nazi, possibly a prisoner, we don't know. And almost within the hearing of her boss, Mingala, she asked me quickly and quietly and with an unforgettable smile of irregular teeth, how old are you? Thirteen, I said, as planned. Fixing, fixing me intently, she whispered, tell him you're fifteen. Two minutes later, it was my turn. I cast a sidelong look at the other line, afraid that the other SS man might look up and recognize me as someone whom he had already rejected. He didn't. When asked for my age, I gave the decisive answer, which I had scorned when my mother suggested it, but accepted it from this stranger. I'm 15. She seems small, the master over life and death remarked. He sounded almost friendly, as if he were evaluating cows and calves. But she's strong, the woman said. Look at the muscles in her legs. She can work. She didn't know me, so why did she do it? He agreed. Why not? She made a note of my number, and I had one extension on my life. Every survivor has his or her lucky accident, the turning point to which we owe our lives. Mine is peculiar because of the intervention of the stranger. Virtually all of those still alive today who have the Auschwitz number on their left arm are older than I am, at least by those three years that I added to my age. There are exceptions, like the underage twins on whom Dr. Mengele performed his pseudo-medical experiments. Then there are some who are my age, but who were selected at the ramp to be sent immediately on to labor camps, and who were thought to be older because there were several layers of clothing by way of of transporting a wardrobe. And then she goes on to reflect on this act of, on this sort of, this, this act of, um, magnanimity or this act of sort of generosity that she tries to understand what it is, who this person is that saved her life, who is not, you know, was working for the Nazis, was working for Mengele. She says, with regard to Mengele, I think his action was arbitrary, hers voluntary. It must have been freely chosen because anyone knowing the circumstances would have predicted the opposite or at least shoulder shugging indifference. Her decision broke the chain of knowledge causes. She was an inmate, and she risked a lot when she prompted me to lie and then openly championed a girl who was too young and small for forced labor and completely unknown to her. She saw me stand in line, a kid sentenced to death. She approached me, she defended me, and she got me through. What more do you need for an example of perfect goodness? And then at the end she says, with regard to the story, I saw it, I experienced it, I benefited from it, I repeat it because there's nothing to add. Listen to me, don't take it apart, absorb it as I'm telling it, and remember it. So this is Kluger reflecting on her own story. So it's an interesting, I mean, for us, I mean, fascinating moment where the individual memoir tells us something about the greater history that we probably couldn't have extrapolated or gotten. We can talk about, of course, the selection, uh, that people were selected on one side, never went to the other side, that there weren't these acts of generosity. Um, but in fact, there are these moments, right? These individual moments that were decisive turning points in someone's life. As simple as, why did this woman, who was a prisoner, working with Mengele, tell her at that moment, you know, say you're 15, and then advocate on behalf of her. Look, she has strong calves, she can work. Um, and in fact, yeah, okay, sure, let her, let her live. I mean, as simple as that, as this massive distinction, right, of who gets to live, who gets to die. And this woman, as Kluger articulates here, had this voluntary moment where she just made it, made, decided to advocate for her, right? I mean, a very profound moment, which uh, in many ways is so connected, I think, uh, to what it means to talk about, you know, human, human life and human uh, morality. Did you have a question or...? Right. I mean, definitely. I mean, it is just, it's, uh, I mean, 
a look in the eyes, a completely, uh, you know, um, a somewhat perhaps random act of generosity, but with profound consequences, right? And even years later, as Kluger tries to reflect on this, you know, she's basically saying, just accept it for what it is. I mean, this is an exemplary act of goodness, and she's like, don't even interpret it further. Don't try to take it apart. Don't try to mix and match it. Uh, this is what happened. I'm telling you, um, accept it as is. So one last thing that I want to, I mean, I, there's, just, there's so much more, I think, from this memoir that's worth talking about and it's worth pondering. There's so many individual small stories that make it up. You know, the story of the man who pressed an orange into her hand, you know, on the subway. Or the story of her going to watch Nazi propaganda films, which is, you know, something she was obsessed with as a little girl. Uh, she wanted to see how they represented her, right? So, I mean, there's these fascinating moments in here. It's a very richly textured memoir. Um, but the one that I want to end with, and this will actually take us into Mouse as well, is I want to talk about this issue of passing as another. Um, this moment where you might remember when she escaped the death march with her mother and she began, uh, she was able to escape into this small German uh, town and receive new identity papers uh, from um, a very generous uh, man who uh, you know, enabled them to get papers and new identifications and begin to live, um, yeah, to begin to live basically as German. Uh, she has this really profound um, experience where she sees a group of Holocaust survivors who are, you know, obviously Jews uh, being marched to this town um, as, as prisoners. And she has this other perspective. She was a prisoner, but now she has this new identity, like living on the other side, basically living as German as passing as German Christian and not as, uh, not as Jewish. And so I want to end by talking about this little thing, about this, and it's this question of passing as the other. And here the other is the norm. The other is the majority. The other is the Christian, German. Um, there's a moment in Mouse, a really interesting moment in Mouse, where the Jews try to pass as Poles, right? You might remember in the memoir where the mice put on masks uh, to become like pigs, right? To, be, to uh, have this idea that their identity is not some kind of essentialized feature that's then been like, you're Jew and that's what you are, or you have this badge on your, you know, on your, on your armband saying this is who you are, and, and instead it's trying to, you know, pass as, yeah, as the other. So uh, here's what she says. She's, so she's in the, the town. She's, uh, the town is, is Straubing. It's a small Bavarian town, um, beautiful resort city. Um, and she is living with her mom as, uh, as a Christian towards the end of the war. And she says basically one day that she went shopping. Uh, so this is after you know, she's escaped. She's new identity, uh, living. I, I went shopping. This is on 145. When suddenly the prisoners of an evacuated concentration camp occupied the street, guarded by SS men and their dogs, and I stood on the sidewalk, I had never seen us from the outside. What separated me from them was a matter of a few weeks, no more, after we had been together for years. They looked so tired, as if they, there was no place on earth left for them. The dogs looked alert, well-fed, and purposeful. My previous comrades walked slowly and with all their strength gone, whereas I had acquired a firmer step in that short time. So she sees them, or so to speak, she sees us from the outside, right? So that from the perspective of how Germans may have seen uh, the Jews, essentially she becomes almost like a bystander in some ways, right? Uh, this amazing perspective of you have a new identity, you are one of them, but you've been fortunate enough to, um, yeah, to essentially escape and get, get a new identity. But this experience is very shocking and extraordinarily you know, traumatic because um, she says that towards the end here that this was her last contact with concentration camp inmates. So she had been you know, in the camps with many other people just like her. She now has this perspective from the outside of having survived and looking at us from the outside. And then she says, and this I think is so interesting, when we talk about bystanders, we talked about that already before. She says they, the the uh, the prisoners, walked right through the middle of town in broad daylight, and there were townspeople to my right and left who looked away, or closed their faces so that nothing could penetrate. We have our own troubles, kindly spare us yours. It's the end of the war, many people are, you know, looking for food and so forth. We waited on the sidewalk until the train of subhumans, quote-unquote, had passed. 
When a few weeks later the Americans occupied the city of Straubing, none of the citizens had seen anything. And in a sense, no one had. For you haven't seen what you haven't perceived and absorbed. In that sense, only I had seen them. And then she says, I still do. Right? This is an extraordinary moment. In the sense, only I had seen them. Meaning only she had perceived uh, these other people as herself. All of the other citizens, you know, looked away. And then she ends the recount by saying, I still do. Right? The sense of, and this I think goes so much to this idea of still alive, the title of the book. The fact that she's, you know, continued to live her 50 or so years after these experiences with that, you know, bullet in her soul. Right? And with these views or visions of these people who, who haunt her, you know, in very profound ways. And so, you know, to call I do, I think, is also to take the memoir immediately out of the context of 1945 and put it all the way through every single year and every single moment of her life that's followed since then. Right? I mean, it's a really, you know, it's very powerful because it's like this experience becomes such a fundamental part of who you are and it's something that's utterly, I mean, in some ways, you, you can't, you can't get rid of it. So, you're haunted. Questions or comments? Let's, uh, so in the interest of time, we have to move to Mouse. Um, hopefully we'll get through as much as we can about, the, about Mouse. It's also quite, it's complicated in, in a number of different ways. And uh, it's one of the things that I think you'll be able to discuss in more detail in your sections. So in the half hour that I have, I'll get through as much as I can, but realize that I can't possibly do it justice in that short a period of time. Um, this is a, a graphic novel, and uh, already that, uh, that raises an interesting question, um, or you could call it graphic history, I suppose would probably be more accurate. Um, it makes use of, and certainly uh, builds upon, the genre of the comic book. Um, after all, the significant uh, parts of this are, well, they're obviously illustrated, and the text comes from uh, putting captions in the mouths of the main characters, who are represented here as, as you know, cats, mice, and pigs. Um, it's also, and I think this is important to recognize, it's a, it's a story about a story. Uh, that is to say, it's about the idea of the second generation, the people who were not there, who were born afterwards, uh, receiving the story of the first generation, the people who were there. And so it's about the telling of the story, right? It's about the transmittal of the memory or of the story. And so I said it's a narrative of second generation learning the story. And there are, in fact, I'd say there are actually probably three intertwining stories here that make this a really quite um, fundamentally complex, um, complex text. You know, first, of course, is a story of, uh, of uh, Art, Artie's father, uh, Vladek. Right? It's the story of the survival. It's also the story of the loss of their first son, uh, Ritsu. It's uh, the story of, um, yeah, it's the story of what happened to the Jews in this small Polish town where they're from. So in that sense, it's a historical story. The second is the story of the son learning the story, right? So it's the transmittal of the story. It's the fact that you know, the father on the little uh, uh, bicycle machine you know, telling the story to the son, and the son then being transported in various ways back uh, to this uh, period in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, and there's a third story, which I think is important to emphasize here, is the story of absence, uh, which is uh, his mother, Anya, Right? The loss of her story, the fact that she's not there to tell her story. Um, even though she survived the war, as you know from reading this, and the parts that are the, the inframed, very dark, um, really in the middle of the text, that are in black, these four pages, are the story of, of his mother's suicide um, when he was 20 years old. And then the father's, as you probably remember, the father's burning of her diaries and essentially the loss of his mother's story. So these three stories intersect. The history, the telling of the story, and the absence of the story are all sort of structuring elements for understanding um, Maus. Now Maus is the German word, by the way, for uh, mouse, M-O-U-S-E, our word for mouse or mice. Uh, so that's what it's referring to. Um, and um, it's obviously significant that this is a story that uh, is as much history and nonfiction um, as anything that we've read before, 
except the genre is radically different, right? I mean, after all, this is making use of the genre of a comic strip. Uh, it reads that way, and as we look through it, um, we're, you know, I think that we're given both a visual as well as, a, I think, a profoundly kind of synoptic view of the, of the Holocaust through um, this telling of the father's story. We'll begin, actually, by looking at this quote. Oops, put that back. This quote that's a kind of a structuring quote uh, for the entire book. I don't know if you, you happen to see it, but it's sort of hiding in the, on the copyright page uh, towards the very, very before the, novel, the, the, the graphic um, story begins. Um, I hesitate to call it a novel because it would imply that it's uh, fictional. It's, it's not fictional. Um, Hitler is quoted, and uh, the quote is, the Jews are undoubtedly a race, but they're not human. Um, it's a profoundly interesting quote, right? I mean, it sort of raises this fundamental paradox uh, that's at stake in uh, creating uh, this text as it is, in representing Jews um, as mice and Germans, German Nazis as cats and Poles as pigs. Um, we've already seen... Uh, we already seen, if you think back to the very uh, second day of class, uh, we already know something about uh, the association of Jews to animals, the dehumanization that uh, was part of Nazi propaganda, right? Uh, if you remember the film The Eternal Jew, you had that very uh, profound and uh, vexing, troubling, deeply anti-Semitic uh, association of Jews uh, with not only vermin, but also with uh, rats. Right? So the analogy that, that Jews are rats scurrying into all the little holes, they're taking over, they're disease carrying, and all these things. Uh, this was part of Nazi propaganda. Right? This was a very fundamental part of the propaganda that the Nazis put together uh, to dehumanize the Jews. So you have a kind of structuring irony. Why then would a post-war second generation uh, a gen a second generation survivor, or essentially someone who's the child of a survivor, represent Jews, uh, take this uh, very loaded, right? Very loaded and potentially anti-Semitic uh, association and uh, depict Jews um, in that same, maybe in that, with that same kind of animal-like way. And then, of course, why are Poles pigs and why are Germans cats? So how do we begin to understand these animal associations just to begin with? I mean, what does it mean to be, uh, yeah, what does it mean to be a mouse? What do you think? How does he undo this stereotype, you might even say? <laughs> Thoughts? Well, what are features of mice? I mean, mice are what? How do you describe them? They're like, mice. They're so sweet, they're little. What else? <laughs> what are mice? What are cats? What are pigs? Right? I mean, how do we understand these, uh, these animal references? I mean, why are people uh, turned into animals? And we have to ask this question, right? I mean, these are not people in here. They're animals, and these animals have very human qualities. So what's the point, right, Julie? What's the point? Hmm? I think, I mean, on one level, that's true. I mean, there's a certain kind of meekness, uh, but I think they're also sweet. Uh, there's, uh, I mean, if you look at the first picture of the father as a mouse, I mean, just to be I mean, very literal, on page 12, I mean, this is the father's, uh, he was a textile buying and selling. He didn't make much when he made a living. I mean, this is a, he has a nice trench coat on. He's a very dapper looking mouse. I mean, this is a very good looking mouse. This is uh, the father. Right? I mean, this is interesting because, I mean, even the depiction here, it's not the kind of the slimy, you know, in the trenches, but it's actually, it's very humanized, uh, very dapper looking, well-dressed, good looking mouse. Um, and it's interesting because already, you know, when we talk about the dehumanization, which we've seen in so many novels, which is, you know, taking away human qualities, one thing that, that Spiegelman does just from the very beginning is, okay, let's make everyone animals and then talk about humanization from that point. Right? So I don't think it's so much that you're turning, you're dehumanizing anyone, but you're actually rehumanizing them by drawing out certain qualities which could only become clear if you make everybody uh, animals. 
So um, on one level, I think the mice are meek and sweet. Uh, the cats are certainly, I think you're right, the cats are somewhat larger and mean. Uh, what about the pigs? Or what about the cats? What about other qualities here? The pigs are the poles, so how are they, like, what kind of qualities go with them? Um, Okay, there's certain qualities of maybe slothfulness that we associate uh, with pigs, right? I mean, that's something we bring. I mean, our own associations are clear here, right? Cats are kind of like nimble and quick, and they attack mice. Mice are the victims, and pigs, slothful, lazy, dirty. I mean, these are things that we already bring these associations to these animals. And sometimes these are stereotypes, but sometimes they're, you know, sometimes they're ones that I think uh, Spiegelman is also trying to examine. So, I mean, we could, we could say slothful, and I think even... I mean, there's certain kind of, I think there are moments in the narrative where the, where the poles are depicted as smug, as to say they're not the ones uh, being uh, persecuted. But there's also moments where, as I mentioned earlier, the mice want to pass as pigs, right? In the same way that Kluger passes as German uh, by assuming a new identity. The mice want to pass as pigs so they can go out and do things, so they're not going to be persecuted by the cats. Um, so there's this issue of also changing identities, which is important, and also revaluing, you know, what it means to talk about these different you know, human qualities by looking at animals. But they're not rats. And I think this is actually something which is important because there's a, there's a fascinating moment, which I don't know if you remember this, but it uh, occurs toward the end, of the, um, the end of his text. If I can find the page offhand here. Yeah. This, this is on uh, 147. Uh, where uh, the mice are actually scared of rats. So he says, uh, and this is, if you happen to have it with you, you can look on the right-hand side on, one, on 147. Uh, this is shortly um, towards the end in uh, 1944. Um, he says, aye, aye, you know, there are rats down here, the mice says. Uh, Shh, calm down, stop screaming. Those aren't rats, they're very small. One ran over before me, they're just mice. Of course it was really rats, but I wanted Anya to feel more uh, at ease. So he's even, he's, he's completely playing with uh, all this history of stereotypes, the history of the way in which attributions of animal-like qualities that had been given by the Nazis to Jews, these things are being like twisted and turned in, in interesting ways to examine the whole history of stereotyping, right? The whole history of having any stereotype uh, applied to anybody by associating them with things that are ostensibly not human, right? I think in many ways we understand the humanity of this story precisely through the fact that everyone's represented as an animal, right? So that's, I think, the kind of the interesting irony is that if you had represented everybody as people, um, in some ways the story would have, lost, would have lost a significant amount of its depth. Uh, the fact that everyone is turned into an animal already raises this very fundamental question about what does it mean to be human? How does one behave towards other people? What kind of qualities, you know, mark different people? Uh, what kind of stereotypes inform them? And so this is as well, you know, it's a very much a profound, I think, examination of stereotypes and the stereotyping uh, of people. Now that um, takes us on a kind of, I think, somewhat deep level. Um, but that level, we have to go there because as soon as we open it up, we don't see people. We see, again, we see animals. Uh, and I think that's, you know, we have to confront that very basic fact. And given the fact that we have the starting point of the entire piece with this quote from Hitler, the Jews are undoubtedly a race, but they're not human, already again raises that question of, okay, what does it mean to depict everyone then as an animal? So, let's talk about the story itself. I mean, hopefully, I mean, you must have read something because you're writing about it for Friday. So, um, with regard to the story, I mean, what is this story about. I mean, uh, if you had to say, like, what happens, what's the action, you know, what happens, what happens here in Mouse? Um, what's the, you know, give us a, a kind of a basic summary of some of the action. Where does it start? Nobody knows. Take up. Right, so it starts, I mean, yeah, it does, exactly. If you, if you open up to the first page, you will find that it starts in Rego Park, New York in 1958. 
Uh, that already is striking to us because we've been talking about this issue of after the war, right? So much of what we've been looking at now is this question of, okay, what's the reception? What's the memory? What's the impact? What's the, what's the way in which the, this, these ideas are transmitted? So this, I, this larger issue of transgenerational memory that I had spoken of last time. This starts a uh, number of years after the war in 1958 when he's uh, a child and from there, it moves even further. It moves further into the. Um, it moves further along, uh, to this point, um, largely in the in the 1970s, where um, Artie is trying to find out. Uh, he basically has these questions of, you know, what happened? Uh, what happened to you during the war? Um, and insofar as he learns these questions, he's also learning about himself, and he's also learning about his mother. Right? And insofar as he's doing those two things, he's also, just like with the memoirs that we looked at, he's also learning about this broader network of history, in some ways encapsulating all those moments of the Holocaust uh, in this individual history. Right? The evacuation of the Jews, the putting them into ghettos, the, before that the stereotyping, um, and then later the concentration camps, the, the desperation, uh, the suicide, all these things um, which become part of telling um, a story of the Holocaust which goes far beyond right, just Vladik's individual story or the story of Vladik and Anya, his, uh, his mom who, the, who killed herself uh, in 68. Where does it go? How does he begin to do this? I mean, in what way is this story conveyed? I mean, how do we, as much as we're learning about Vladik's story, what else are we, how do we learn about these other two stories, meaning the story of the son learning about the story and the story of uh, the mother. How do those things fit in? Thoughts? You all are very silent today. Yeah. I know lots of you read it because you've read it before and, uh, and you've had it in front of you. Thoughts? Please. Right, I mean, there's, please finish. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, not only do we see changes in the, in the speech uh, of, the, of the father as he's narrating the past, so changes from the past to the, and the present, but you also get, I mean, visual cues that, that give us uh, something. I mean, these visual cues are also uh, important because the relationship between the language, the telling of the story, the different kinds of language used, and the different visual clues that come here are really um, are central. I mean, we first find out, you know, the, I mean, just as a visual clue, that uh, Vladik is, is a survivor on page 12 because we see him on the exercise bike with a tattoo on his forearm, right? So it's not something that's narrated. It's not, it's not so much that's told. They don't read his tattoo, but we see it. It's a visual clue, right? And as the story goes at various points, uh, it's intercut uh, throughout here. And I think it's almost like you could say it's like the way in which a film has intercuts in it. The intercuts here happen to be between the story a kind of transporting back into the past in a kind of, you know, um, in a kind of Spielberg-like sense of being taken back to 1930 or 1940, right? Being taken back to the past and in those moments that stop it where the, the father comes back to the present and, you know, says, you know, oh, I can't go on telling you about this or don't talk about this part. Uh, those moments that re you realize that you're learning about the telling of a story as much as you're learning about a story. Right? So there's these, always these moments, so like on page 23, he says, um, he interrupts the story and says, you know, I can tell you other stories, uh, but such private things I don't want to mention. Okay, I promise, I won't, you know, I won't tell you those things. And, and they're kind of cloaked in a more kind of darker, uh, a sort of, a kind of shadow-like figure. Um, the point here again is that the telling of the story is as important as the story itself. The reception of the story as important as what the story is. 
Uh, and this is why you have these, ma these discontinuities, these interruptions, these moments of break. And I think you get them, as you said, you know, linguistically we see them, but also you know, through visual clues that uh, constantly interrupt the narrative. I mean, the most profound interruption, you know, if we want to say, the most profound is certainly these, two page these four pages surrounded by the black where you have an intrusion, interestingly enough, of the only photograph in the entire narrative, uh, the photograph uh, of the mother um, from 1968, the same year that she killed herself, right? So this is, uh, as much as this is all about, you know, the graphic aspects, the way in which the son is representing uh, the father's story and embedding it within a greater context, you have this moment where the photograph uh, is essentially acting like a historical witness, a document of his mom, you know, alive, and then framed by this horrific uh, sort of revelation that she had taken pills and slashed her wrists and, and killed herself. Uh, that being part of the story as well, that the son, this fundamental loss, right, at the centerpiece of this, of this text is the loss of his mom's story and the fact that the father can only speak on behalf, right? And, uh, and of course, he made a decision to burn the mother's diaries, which is something that we only find out as, as this goes forward. And then there's this fundamentally irredeemable part of the history, right? The fact that the mother's story, in her own words, would never be found, right? It's never, it's, it's lost. It's permanently lost. And uh, this, you know, results at the end in the accusation that Artie makes to his father um, by calling him, amazingly enough, him, calling him a murderer, right? Uh, so he murdered his mom's story, uh, or so to speak, made it inaccessible to him. So let's uh, talk about a couple other um, aspects. Uh, let's see, I want to make sure that we mention today. I mean, if you look on, I mean, I had mentioned already that this kind of encapsulates a, a broader, the broad history of the Holocaust. I mean, on page 33, for example, which is when the, the, the father begins to talk about the, the rise of Nazism, the coming of, the, of essentially the, the origins of the end. Um, in many ways, what I think makes this so compelling is that in some ways it's encapsulating the entire history that we've been looking at, um, as well as the post-war history, uh, through these very profound, um, profound vignettes, uh, essentially almost like um, they, 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 they contain much more uh, than just you know, sort of ostensibly what's there. So for him to talk about, you know, we had to go out and buy yellow stars or you have people holding up signs that say, I'm a filthy Jew with the rise of Nazi behind you. You realize, or this, the declaration the Nazis have, you know, on the next frame that this town is Jew free. Um, we read this, I mean, in a very kind of deep way, realizing that this is not just a singular moment or singular idiosyncratic story, but this stands for a much kind of broader, greater, something of significantly more magnitude. And in some ways, seeing it, you know, visually, depicted in a way that we've begun already to make associations, I think, with these characters as animals, right? It somehow, I think, registers on a very, um, very pretty profound emotional level um, maybe in a way that differs from the way in which we encounter, you know, just written word. So the visual aspects here, you know, also very much uh, are inspiring uh, this kind of interpretation. Let's, um, I had mentioned uh, the part where they, this issue of passing, which I want to actually look at that, because I think it's, it's a really, it's a fascinating moment uh, in, the, in the story. Um, so if you look, at, if you happen to have this with you, you have 136 or 137, uh, there's this issue of, of, of masking going on. And this is something that um, I think definitely connects back, so this is this third part, passing as another, um, Kluger living as a German Christian in this town and seeing us from the outside. Uh, the decision that um, is made for the mice, uh, the Spiegelmans, um, to don masks, right, to basically attempt to pass as Polish in order to go out, in order to go out in the town. So on 136 and 137, they, they basically, they go outside. There's the, the fear of being caught, of being revealed for what you're not. And so there's a, a pig that looks out the window, you know, and it's, of course, it's a pole who peers from her window. And, I mean, you could say, you know, a bystander looking out the window and saying, hey, there's a Jewish in the courtyard, police, 
you know, call them up um, because they're trying to pass as something that they're, that they're not. Um, extraordinarily interesting because this is so much about this, these problems and questions of identity, of stereotyping, of uh, trying to, you know, pass as something that you're, you're not. Uh, but the significance of being what you are is only something that's connected to people in power who decide that that part of who you are is so, like the linchpin of, of your identity. Like you're, you're a Jew and that's all you are. You're no longer human. Uh, so in that regard, you could even say that there's something, something very profoundly disturbing about Hitler's quote. Um, that's true. They were dehumanizing people. But imagine, you know, how this process takes place uh, through radical stereotyping and kind of playing with those stereotypes in this, you know, kind of visual environment. All right. A couple last questions, uh, last comments that I'll make then. So hopefully you'll have, you'll be somewhat more gregarious in, uh, in section. And uh, I'm sure you will. I want to say something about just the reception of this, um, of, of Spiegelman's mouse. And uh, sort of end with uh, this. Um, we talked about genre at the very beginning of class today. And it's a question that this is obviously, I mean, in many ways, very genre defying for Holocaust uh, narratives. Um, it doesn't really look like a work of history. It certainly doesn't look like a film. Um, it's not exactly a memoir. Um, and so the question, you know, arises, like, you know, what is it? Uh, and how does it contribute to our understanding of the Holocaust? Um, these are questions, you know, I think you should discuss and think about in section. I mean, how does it contribute to our understanding of the Holocaust? Uh, how does it, where does its powerfulness come from? And how does it relate to other, you know, more straightforward memoirs that we have read in class? So when the New York Times uh, reviewed the book uh, and also published it, and this is in 91 when it, when it came out, um, they actually had classified it uh, as, as fiction. Um, they say as, as, as made up, as fiction, as literature. Um, this is something that bothered Spiegelman right away. Uh, that this is something that he was very insistent that this is not made up. Although it looks like you have animals here talking, and ostensibly animals talking would probably qualify for fiction, or at least literature, he says that no, animals talking does not qualify as literature. Um, in fact, uh, this, is, this is something that, that bothers him tremendously, and he, in fact, insists that it it's, needs to be recognized as history and nonfiction. Now, you know, to speak, uh, it's an interesting question, because, you know, to speak on the side of the New York Times, I mean, if you just, you know, absolutely literally, I mean, it is animals talking, after all. And so, I mean, clearly animals don't talk, and you can almost understand uh, the impulse here. Now, of course, you want to be more sophisticated than that. We're going to say, no, okay, let's, let's actually understand the story and uh, its connection to um, the historical reality. And so Spiegelman writes a letter to the New York Times, and I'll, I'll read you a brief part of this letter. It says um, to the New York Times, if your list were divided into literature and non-literature, I could gracefully accept the compliment as intended, meaning this is a work of literature. But to the extent that fiction indicates that a work isn't factual, I feel a bit queasy. As an author, I believe that I might have lopped several years off the 13 that I devoted to my two-volume project if I could only have taken a few novelists' license while searching for a novelistic structure, meaning if I just made it up. The borderland between fiction and nonfiction has been fertile territory for some of the most potent contemporary writing. And it's not as though my passages on how to build a bunker and repair a concentration camp boots got the book onto your advice and how-to or miscellaneous list. It's just that I shudder to think how David Duke, um, who is an outknown KKK member, I shudder to think how David Duke uh, would respond to seeing a carefully researched work based closely on my father's memories of life in Hitler's Europe and the death camps classified as fiction. I know that b by delineating people with animal heads, I raise problems of taxonomy for you. Could you consider adding a special non-fiction mice category to your list? Uh, meaning, non-fiction mice, uh, meaning the point here is that this is, uh, this is not a work of fiction. Uh, in fact, he's afraid that people wouldn't take it seriously if they perceive it as being imagined, made up, make-believe, uh, fictional. And potentially, it could even serve the opposite side, which is people who might deny the Holocaust or say, yeah, you're just making it all up. This isn't true. 
um, he's deeply disturbed by that. And so it's an interesting, you know, very interesting reflection on the status of fiction and non-fiction with regard to the Holocaust, but also the way in which devices that we traditionally associate with fiction, like you know, animals talking, um, you know, think animal farm or something, this becomes the very basis of factual historical knowledge. Okay. So, we'll end there. Uh, do make sure you see the movie on Monday, just a reminder. Monday, 7 o'clock in Haynes, paragraph 175.